or maybe during the weekend. Welcome back to NE630 uh, Nuclear Reactor Theory. Uh, we will continue the same business for the review. So, Mike, if you please uh, can bring the uh, projector here or the, or the, the monitor here. Okay. So, again, uh, I showed you last time that we try to solve the diffusion equation, the time dependent diffusion equation. We make the separation of variable. We stated that the flux is a function of position and a function of time. If you substitute, you will obtain two uh, uh, independent equations. Uh, the first equation, when you will solve, you will notice that the time dependent solution for the flux is just an exponential function. In this case, e to the power of minus lambda t, and we stated. Uh, last uh, time that it depends on the value of lambda whether it is positive negative or zero zero you do not have any change positive you will have exponentially decaying negative you will have exponentially increasing function then when we solve this for a slab when we solve the time independent component of the equation in the slab we obtained uh, the reactor equation and this is we call it the reactor equation or Hel Helmholtz equation and by solving this reactor equation with the geometrical buckling included, we uh, found the geometrical buckling for several types of reactor for a slab geometry. We note that this geometrical buckling is just n by over a uh, extrapolated, but we stated clearly that all the higher order n terms will decay away, so we will be interested in the first harmonic, so n will be equal to 1, so the buckling will be by over a extrapolated. So uh, we solve it again uh, this equation for a couple of other geometries and we were able to uh, get the value for the geometrical buckling for different types of, uh, of uh, reactors. Um, when we solve it this for cylindrical uh, uh, core for example we notice that the flux in the uh, radial direction is represented by a Bessel function while the flux on the axial direction is represented by uh, cosine function and the geometrical buckling again was uh, uh, represented by the submission of two uh, buckling components one in the r direction and one in the z direction and the one in the r direction was just uh, new over uh, new over uh, uh, capital R tilde and u was just the 2.45, uh, 405, uh, the first zero of the Bessel function, and the uh, buckling in the uh, uh, height in the axial direction was just uh, uh, by over uh, h, h tilde, and h tilde is just the uh, extrapolated, extrapolated height. And again, we said last time that we can calculate the constant uh, in front of the flux uh, function by just calculating the power of the reactor and the power will depend on the volume of the reactor so if you will integrate you will find out a, a formula for the uh, for the constant here so this is if we uh, try to optimize as the homework I think number three when I give you a couple of problems so that you will optimize for the shape of the reactor for example um, we note that uh, what's the best shape for for uh, minimizing the buckling? Sphere. It's a sphere, and of course, a sphere is not a uh, a practical shape for a nuclear reactor. So, what comes after the sphere is the volume of what cylinder, then then the volume for the barrel pipe uh, shape. And as all of you uh, practiced this in the last homework, couple of problems was regarding calculating the buckling and calculating the uh, critical volume and so on. So from solving the, the equation, uh, we notice that we do not no longer need to solve the time dependent <coughs> diffusion equation. We reach to the critical condition, which is k effective equal to uh, k uh, inf infinite multiplied by 1 divided by 1 plus p square uh, l square. Uh, then we, uh, after we solved the, the diffusion equation for the for the uh, slab geometry, we looked at the case where the slab is no longer bare reactor, but it is surrounded by what moderator, and we solved the diffusion equation in both the core and the reflector, and we also uh, 
apply the boundary condition at the interface between the core and the reflector and the boundary condition was the, was what at the at the uh, at the uh, interface the flux is what is uniform so the same similar and the current is what the current in the left or the current in the right equal to the current in the left plus half the source if there is source of course there is no source in between the reflector and the uh, and the core so you will you will have continuity of current also in this situation so when we did this we reached to a transcendental equation and I last time I told you what do we mean by transcendental equation the, those are equations that you have the independent variables in both sides and it's not, not separable you cannot separate like x equal to e to the power of ax you cannot separate x from both equations because if you try to separate x you will take the logarithm of the left hand side here and you will end up with ax on the other side so you will never be able to separate it so the only way to solve this equation is by graphical method or by applying numerical uh, iteration techniques so we solve it we when we solve it the uh, diffusion equation in the core and in the uh, reflector we reach to a transcendental equation that when we solve this transcendental equation we find out that the the buckling is less than by over a so the buckling in this lab was by over a but the buckling in this is in a bare slab the buckling in a reflected slab was less than by over a which means that we saved by the presence of the reflector we saved in what in the critical dimension of the core so if you if you if you put a reflector around your core if somebody asks you in an, in an interview question what's the benefit of, of putting a reflector around a bare reactor so you can say I can either reduce the size of my reactor or I can decrease the critical mass I, I keep the same core for example but I will decrease the critical the critical mass will decrease so if you want the core to have the same size you decrease what the critical mass or if you want to be to have a compact core you will do what you will just keep the critical mass the same or the critical composition the same not mass the critical composition the same but you reduce the, the volume and this is why in, in, in Navy for example when you have we have a, a highly enriched uh, uh, uranium it, it reaches to some something like 90 percent enrichment because of several things one of them is you do not want to refuel your your Navy submarine every couple of months or whatever maybe you will you will you refuel it after after years so this this highly enriched uranium core will last for a long time and also this will when you when you put a reflector or whatever you will make it a, a very compact very compact core so you have a very compact core for your reactor so again uh, after this we started the self shielding and we knew that self shielding we have two factors or two phenomena for the self shielding in reactor physics one is caused by the special self shielding which is the effect of the outermost layers on the absorption of the neutrons so the outermost layers will absorb neutrons and will reduce the neutron flux going into the center of the fuel so if I asked you you will say that the self shielding is is because of the high absorption of the outermost layers of the fuel to prevent or reduce the neutrons from penetrating into the center of the fuel if I ask you about the uh, the energy self shielding you will say that this is the reduction in the neutron flux because of the presence of a very high absorber a very high uh, uh, resonance absorption so you will you will say that the flux goes like in the in the moderation region goes like what some constant divided by divided by sigma absorption multiplied by xc which is the, uh, the average lethargy uh, increase or average average energy loss per, per collision multiplied by e the energy so so this absorption in the denominator well when you have a a, a very high resonance absorption cross section the, the the flux will go will go down so the flux will go down the the absorption the absorption cross section is very high the flux in the in the absorption region will do what will have a dip 
and the absorption the the absorption will 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 will, will decrease in this uh, in this case okay guys and again if i asked you about doubler broadening doubler broadening you will say what you will say that the doubler broadening the the cross section will broaden so the maximum or the peak of the cross section will go at will go down and the flux will go up accordingly and the absorption will increase and this will lead to what more absorption in the resonance and this will 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 be a negative feedback effect that will try to reduce the multiplication factor and reduce the criticality of the core and this will bring the the core power down this is for positive reactivity uh, uh, feedback coefficient negative temperature reactivity temperature feedback coefficient then uh, we stated that when we solve the diffusion equation, what we did is we solved the diffusion equation under two assumptions. One is it is one group diffusion equation. What else? Yes. No, no, no. I'm talking about the diffusion equation when we solved the diffusion equation the first time. It's one, one group, one energy group, and it is homogeneous reactive. So, but but the actual situation is we do not have a homogeneous reactor. It, it's it's so it, it was experimental. There is there was an experimental homogeneous reactor before that they have this this molten salt reactors that you have everything is homogenized in, in a molten salt fashion and you just uh, recirculate the fluid which contain the molten salt fuel plus the the, the moderator. Uh, and the coolant, which is in this case maybe the, the liquid that the molten salt is is dissolved in, but in, in in the real in reality the reactor core is not is not homogeneous, so the reactor core is heterogeneous. So in order to solve this heterogeneous reactor and solve this diffusion equation, what we have to do is homogenize the reactor core. How to homogenize the reactor core? You have to pick up unit cells, and again the unit cells are different. So if you come to uh, 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 fuel assembly where you are in the in the in the core of the fuel itself you will pick up your your fuel cell to be part of the fuel and part of the moderator if you are on the periphery of the fuel cell you will have what you will have uh, let's say a, a, a cladding maybe and of course in the, uh, the previous case also you will have a cladding but you will have a cladding you have structural material and you have maybe the moderator and if you are near to a control rod you will have part of the control rod and so on yes so there is several unit cells that you can use and you can pick up in our reactor core and again what we did this is here what you see here in, in this plot is just one assembly as uh, four assemblies and those four assemblies you have a, a cruciform control rod that's that's inserted between those four assemblies each one of those assemblies has those uh, fuel uh, bins yes so what we do is we take one of this fuel bin surrounded by what the moderator and try to solve try to solve what the diffusion equation so last time I told you that we can do the homogenization just by averaging over the what the volume but averaging over the vo volume if I ask you a question in the exam why averaging over the volume is not appropriate in case of homogenization. What you will say? It doesn't take into account special self-shielding. Yeah, it does not take into account the special self-shielding. So you have to do something different. So, so the something different is we solved it last time. What? Here is the the unit cell, but this unit cell is not the uh, uh, spherical uh, uh, reactor bins or fuel uh, reactor fuel. It's a slab fuel, and we took uh, the fuel here the moderator here, fuel here, moderator here. So the unit cell was composed of, let's say, half of the fuel and half of the moderator. And we solved what? The diffusion equation and the slab geometry in the fuel and in the what? In the moderator. Then once you solve it, this with the boundary condition and interface condition, once you solve it, this, you get this large blah, blah, blah form of the flux in the fuel and this large functional form of the flux in the what? Moderator. Then by just averaging the flux in the in the moderator over the flux in the fuel, we got this zeta or xe or whatever Greek letter, and this was what the thermal disadvantage factor, and this thermal disadvantage factor is just an indicative of the self shielding. It tells us how the average flux in the moderator relates to the average flux in the what 
in the favor. It tells you what's the ratio of the flux. You expect the flux in the moderator to be higher than the flux in what? In the fuel. So this this xz here should be greater than what? Greater than one. Then then again you will use this one to do what now? So instead of just averaging over cross section over the volume, we will use the flux inside what? Inside the fuel and the flux inside what? The moderator. So when you will do this, you will notice that you no longer will use the volume average alone, but the effective cross section now, homogenized effective cross section, will be this homogeneous case. The homogeneous case which will be just averaging over the volume, multiplied by what? Multiplying by some function that has the thermal disadvantage uh, represented. So this is the heterogeneous uh, utilization factor equal to the homogeneous utilization factor, which is as if you are in a homogeneous reactor multiplied by this uh, function of cross-section and, and volumes and also the thermal disadvantage factor. Again, I'm, I'm not going to tell you how we will measure the thermal utilization factor. I'm not asking you to do this. This is the, uh, can be covered in, in, a, in a reactor, reactor physics uh, laboratory experiment sort of course. Uh, now, again, we talked about something very important in nuclear reactors, which is the local power baking factor. And we stated that what's the baking factor? We stated that the baking factor is what? Because we knew that the flux is sinusoidal in shape. So which one will be better for us to have to have something like this or to have something like this? The huh? The second one. Why? Because the baking factor here, if you take the average of this, this is the average somewhere here. And this is the maximum. So phi maximum divided by phi average will be what? Would be high. So this is the baking factor. But here, the average will be here and the maximum will be here. So phi maximum and phi average. So the, the, the baking factor in this case would be a little bit what? Lower. So if I give you, for example, in the exam, two different situations like this, and I tell, I'm asking you which case would be more favorable in, in designing your nuclear reactor, you should say that the second case is better than the first case. So this is local power <coughs> baking factor, and we'll show you how to do the calculation for this. Again, uh, last, last part of this, we showed, you how to, we showed you how to do the homogenization for the control rod, but we said that the homogenization of the control rod is a little bit difficult. And we have to use what? We have to use the assistance of the, diffusion, the transport equation, because the diffusion equation will fail if you use it near a control rod because of the high absorption cross-section. And one of the assumptions that we utilize in deriving the diffusion equation is sigma absorption is neglected compared to sigma scattering. So we used the, diff the diffusion equation, we used what? We used the transport theory. What we did is for this cruciform control rod, we said that we will transform it from if the, if the diffusion length is, is uh, Last time we, we said that if the diffusion length, length is, is, is what? Is, is greater or is less than or what? The ratio of what? So if the diffusion length here, if the length L of the control blade is long enough compared to the diffusion length, we can transform this from 2D, this is X and Y, the control rod. We transform it this from 2D to what? To 1D dimension by just conserving the surface to volume ratio. The surface of the control rod divided by the volume of the control rod and we get a representation for what? The surface to volume ratio is one over what? One over length, which is one over A. And we showed you last time what A should be. We solved it and we got the uh, final relation for the flux in terms of this what? This, this parameter, which is the surface to, to volume ratio. Uh, and and then then after we solved this, we looked at the um, control rod alone. Only one control rod. If you use the case where you have one control rod or you have a control control uh, bank, control bank you have several control 
control rods in, in different area of the reactor and you move them all together up and down or whatever versus if you use a case where you have only one single control rod again then we show you we showed you last time uh, what's the effect of moving this control rod and in case of if you have a, a neutronically tight core versus neutronically loose core so neutronically tight core the shape function for the flux which is the flux as a function of position will reshape itself again and return back to the original shape after the disturbance uh, start so if the reactor core is, is, is compact and the diffusion length is, is not that small compared to the dimension of your reactor the any disturbance will propagate very fast in a in a in a in a few min free bath time uh, f a few min lifetime sorry and in this case what will happen is the propagation for the disturbance will propagate very fast and you will have retained the same sh the same shape this is if the reactor is neutronically tight if the reactor reactor is neutronically loose core so in this case if you have a if you have a problem or disturbance uh, because of uh, removing or inserting a control rod the propagation of the of this disturbance to the other side of the core will take long time compared to the neutron generation time and you will not be able to retain the same flux flux shaving function inside of the reactor and and again when we said this we said that this is very important in driving what what equation we base this model in driving what equation without looking at anything, if you remember. What equation represent or describe the time behavior of neutron inside the reactor? Time the kinetic equation. And we said that our kinetic equation is called what? In hour. No, no, I'm not talking about the in hour. In hour is the solution. The kinetic point equation is called point. point kinetic equation. Why we call it point kinetic? Because we assume the shape is constant. Because we assume that the flux can be represented as the multiplication of two functions. One is a shape function, which does not change, and the other one is what? Time. Is a time-dependent component. And we said that in, in, in reactors that has neutronically tight core, the disturbance will move very fast so that the shape function will be what? Will not change. So you can eliminate phi of r from the d by dt component and phi of r from the rest of the components and you will end up with an equation that's function of what? Time. Function of time. And this is the point kinetic equation. If we cannot resolve the two components separately or separate the two components, this equation will be called what? Spatial kinetic equation. I talked to you about this. The spatial kinetic equation is the kinetic equation you have to solve it in space and also in what? In time, because the shape of the flux does not retain the same shape. So the flux will be distorted and it will be dependent of what? Dependent on time and space. Okay, guys? Then, in order to drive the diffusion equation, we have to drive the constants ins inside the diffusion equation. Those constants are average over what? average over the flux. You have to average D over energy. You have to average sigma absorption over energy. You have to average sigma nu over energy. So we have to get this, what we call this weighting flux, so that we will be able to average over what? To average over the energy. So the chapter of the energy behavior of the neutrons inside the reactor was responsible, or the focus of this chapter was to deduce the shape of the neutron what? of the neutron flux energy dependent in, in all the region. How many region we describe in this chapter? Three, three. three or four? four? It's actually three, but the fourth one included in the, in the middle one. So it is the, what, the first, the first uh, part is what? The fast energy region. And we showed that the flux is nearly what? Proportional to chi distribution. And this is very valid assumption from half a mev and up, yes? But between, let's say, between half a mev and 100, let's say, uh, or one mev and 100 kilo electron volt, 
the shape can can be altered by another function that contain some absorption and we have to reiterate until we got the actual flux but we said from 500 kilo electron volt and above this is a very good approximation for what for the sh for the shape of the neutron flux then we studied the flux in the in the what in the moderation region between one electron volt and half mev or 100 kilo electron volt let's say 100 kilo electron volt and we said that the first time we try to understand how the neutron will moderate only in the presence of what hydrogenous material then we moved on and said okay let's look at the moderation with respect to another another non hydrogenous uh, scatterer or hydrogenous hydrogenous uh, moderator and then we added what we added absorption to look at what's the effect of the absorption and we finally find in all cases the flux will go like 1 over 1 over e multiplied or modified by the shape function of the cross section 1 over sigma absorption plus sigma scattering both of them are a function of e so 1 over e multiplied by sigma scattering of e plus sigma absorption of e so the 1 over e is modified by the shape function of the cross section and also modified or attenuated by the absorption from the region above the point of interest that you are looking for so you have e to the power of integral of de over e plus blah 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 yes so this is the shape of the flux so here is the shape that we see here the chi distribution 1 over e then this is what this is the Maxwellian distribution again I show you the methodology how we do this then uh, for the fission source the, the, the uh, main idea behind the calculation of this chapter is to write down the what the balance equation and the balance equation is a steady state what just a steady state equation we do not have d, d, d by dt all what we say is how many neutrons getting into your energy band E and how many neutrons are getting out whether it is by absorption or whether it is by what by scattering so this is the balance equation so if I asked you write the balance equation for this uh, shape you would be able to, to tell me what's the balance equation here yes I did not put the exam yet but this those are question if I asked you I've give, I've give you this shape and I told you that this is energy E and this is the energy E prime and this is the E up and this is let's say 50 kilo electron volt write the balance equation in this case you will be able to tell me that the balance equation is this sigma absorption in this energy plus sigma scattering in this energy multiplied by the flux this is the total what total losses equal to the, uh, the what sources and the sources is coming from what fission so the fission comes from everywhere fish so you have fission everywhere and this fission will produce new neutrons at energy E within delta E so this will be given by what sigma fission at energy E prime multiplied by phi E prime de prime so this is the fission at energy what E prime but E prime goes from where to where 50 kilo electron volt and up yes and, and I can transform it instead of 50 kilo electron volt and up I can transform it let's say from 0 to infinity 0 to infinity no, not 50 actually from 0 to infinity okay because you can have fission at third usually the fission at thermal energy yes and there is fission at fast energy but it's not as important as the fission at what the thermal energy this is why I extend it to what infinity and then you multiply this by the number of neutron produced and some of those neutrons would be produced at energy E according to the probability distribution function chi of E okay guys then we moved on we got the flux and we showed that the flux is chi of E and it is modified by the shape of the distribution function in this case the what the total cross section okay guys we moved on to the slowing down region we wrote the balance equation and we showed that this is the balance equation now in the moderation region we have to write what the scattering what the out scattering out out scattering term this is called the out scattering term the out scattering term is just what whatever you have here at E prime will scatter and show up at E and it's given by sigma scattering of E prime goes to E multiplied by phi of E prime d E prime okay guys and when you solve this we we note that for 
the case of the absorption by uh, hydrogenous material, we reach it to uh, we reach it to moderation by hydrogenous material only. We did some. If you if you notice when I did this for you for the last time, we said that we will do some assumption. And what's the assumption that we usually do for this chapter? The shape function. Shape function of sigma scattering of E multiplied by phi of E over E does not change. Because what? Because for alpha E, which is like hydrogen or whatever, or for very heavy, very heavy absorber, alpha E will be what? Nearly 1. So alpha E, E minus alpha E will be nearly 0. So the region that you are integrating over is very, very tiny. So you can say that this shape function does not change in this energy region, in this integral integration region. So when you do this, we reach it to the conclusion that the flux is given by what? 1 over E. And this is a constant because E1 is a constant, E1 is a constant, E1 is a constant. So sigma total of E1, phi of E1, E1, this is a constant modified by the total cross section the shape of the energy dependent total cross section and modified by the attenuation coefficient here that take into consideration the absorption above energy what? Above energy E. And if you remember when we calculate the resonance absorption cross section, we notice that the above absorption, the absorption above the resonance was very, very tiny, was negligible. Something like it accounts for 4% if you remember when we did this. So again, uh, we did the same for the uh, the uh, case for uh, absorption and moderation with uh, um, uh, nuclei higher than higher than uh, a equal to one. Uh, we also look at the self shielding phenomena and we look for the case for uranium 238 and we notice that uh, uh, it's only 0.4 percent. It's not even 4 percent. 0.4 percent of neutron are uh, slowing down, best the resonance E will be likely absorbed before the, uh, the resonance. Then we look at the slowing down for non-hydrogenous material. We do use similar tricks to solve the equation and we reach to the final conclusion that the flux should be what? Proportional to also CK proportional to E. But for the case for when you have a uh, slowing down with a uh, nuclei higher than the hydrogen, we came up with the definition of the slowing down density. And I told you that the slowing down density, it's what? It's density function. It's unlike the flux. The flux is a surface function. It's, it's, it's defined as the number of neutron per unit area. But slowing down is per unit what? Per unit volume. And it's a number slowing down beneath energy E. But the flux is the number at energy E that penetrate per unit area. So you have to know what's the difference between those. And finally, we obtain a flux that is a function uh, of energy here, which is the slowing down divided by Xc multiplied by sigma of E multiplied by, by E. Then we moved on and we calculated the flux in the thermal energy region. And we noticed that the flux in the thermal energy region was just given by a Maxwellian distribution function. But we stated clearly that the Maxwellian function will be modified by two phenomena. Any of you remember what are the two phenomena for the for the flux in the thermal energy region? It's hardening. Yeah, the hardening is because of what? Hardening mean you move okay, logically, what does it mean hardening? When you harden something, you move toward the higher energy because you harder energies. Yes? Softer X soft X ray is what? Low energy X ray. Remember it like this. Hard X-ray toward what? High, high energy. So hardening the neutron energy, meaning that you move towards Fast. higher energy. So you lose your you lose your what? Your, your low. low. Where did you lose your low energy neutrons? In the, the in the in the in the absorption. So the low energy neutron get absorbed faster than the high energy neutrons. So the absorption is called absorption hardening. And there is another phenomena opposite to this. So the other process is to make your, your Maxwellian cooler, which is softer, we call it cooling. So cooling, you, you reduce the number of fast neutrons in your, in, your, uh, in your spectrum. So this is done by what? 
by leakage, diffusion. When you diffuse while you are diffusing, you leak. Which one has the more probability to leak outside the reactor, the faster okay. neutrons or the slower okay. neutrons? So the slower neutrons will, the, will not leak as the faster neutrons. The faster neutrons will do what? Will leak more, so you will lose a b- bunch of the higher energy neutrons, and this is the diffusion cooling process that we have. Then we said that the flux is not perfectly, perfectly Maxwellian. It is Maxwellian modified by the absorption at the low energy and modified by what? Modified by the leaky. So we have to come up with two functions that describe this. So we said that in order to do this, now we will, we will, it's not a Maxwellian, so we will write it as a Maxwellian, but with a new temperature. And this temperature is not the temperature defined by the medium, it's called the neutron temperature. And if you remember the neutron temperature, when we did this neutron temperature calculation, we come up with uh, uh, a value, a value for this uh, function, and it is here. Tn equal to T multiplied by 1 plus C sigma absorption over XC sigma scattering. And this term here in this function is because of what? Absorption. absorption. So if you have absorption equal to zero, if you are in a medium where you have zero absorption, what, what will happen now? Tn will equal to what? T. To T of the medium. So the neutron temperature will be the same as the medium temperature. So if, if I ask you when is the defined the neutron temperature and when the neutron temperature will be equal to the medium temperature, you will tell me what? You will tell me this neutron temperature is defined as a temperature for the Maxwellian distribution because it's not a Maxwellian distribution. We modify the Maxwellian distribution by introducing a new temperature that, that's called neutron temperature that, that will take into account the effect of what? Absorption. The effect of absorption of the medium. And then we, we define that uh, when the flux in the Maxwellian case is modified by the 1 over E uh, tail of the intermediate energy region, and we said we have to make an overlapping function that will join the Maxwellian with this, uh, this uh, 1 over E absorber. And we stated that uh, if, the, if the energy of the uh, neutron is, is less than 5 kT, the Maxwellian will be a good approximation. If it is between 5 kT and 10 kT, we have to use this overlapping function. And if it is higher than 10 kT, it will be just the 1 over E absorption. Then we put a lambda. So this is the Maxwellian flux plus lambda multiplied by this shaping function. And this shaping function is just delta. And delta is a function of E over kT n, okay, modified by the 1 over E. So if if the delta, this delta, if if the flux is if E over KT is greater than ten, this delta will be what? Will be one. This delta function will be one. Then you will have a Maxwellian flux plus one over E <coughs> abs- uh, absorbing region. And if the KT over E is less than five, this delta will be zero, and you will have fully Maxwellian distribution. And again, I show you this is the Maxwellian, should be like this, decaying faster, but this is the one over E, and this is the overlap region here that you see it here. Okay, guys? Then we moved on and we, dis- we, we di- discussed the resonance region, and we showed that we have two approximation in this region and region. What are the two approximation, if you remember? We have the narrow resonance approximation and narrow wide resonance approximation. And we stated that the wide resonance approximation, if the neutron will get into the resonance, what happened? The energy loss is very small compared to the width of the resonance. So the neutron will start doing multiple collision inside the wide resonance, so there is a big chance that the neutron will not leave the resonance and will be absorbed. But for the narrow resonance, the energy loss will be larger compared to the width of this resonance and the neutron maybe in one collision will be kicked outside the resonance region and in both cases we calculated the resonance integral. Why we have to calculate the resonance integral? Yeah, the sharks. But why Why we have to calculate the resonance integral? Because if you remember the resonance integral is a very uh, large component 
in calculating P and P is just e to the power of what? I if you remember multiplied by XC sigma scattering multiplied by N fuel yes so I is the resonance integral and N fuel is the number density of the fuel and XC sigma scattering is the uh, slowing down power for the uh, for the uh, for the uh, uh, moderator of, of, of use in, the, in, in this case so you have to calculate I so that you will be able to calculate what? P, which is the resonance escape probability, which is very important in calculating K effective. Okay, guys. Then um, we moved on and we started the uh, solution. Again, we look at the resonance and the uh, shape of the flux and the resonance. And again, we notice that the flux and the resonance will have the same shape, 1 over A, but modified by sigma total and the resonance and sigma moderator and so on. Then, um, once we finish the resonance region, we moved on and we derive or deduce the what? The, 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 the kinetic, neutron kinetic equation. And when we deduce the neutron kinetic equation, we notice that this equation has many, how many roots? Seven. Seven roots. So in order to solve it, you have to solve it either numerically or you have to do some some assumption. So we solve it graphically and we obtain the in our equation and we showed if you have rho greater than zero, rho equal to zero, low, rho less than zero. For rho less than zero, what will happen? No matter what you will insert as reactivity inside your core, your core will not uh, decay faster than the the asymptotic period, which is one over lambda, the first, the first, uh, uh, the first delayed neutron decay time. Yes, if rho equal to zero, it's a critical. If rho greater than zero, you will have one positive root and six negative roots. When you have rho less than zero, you will have six, seven negative roots. So you will you will be decaying. You will be decaying in this case uh, exponentially. Then. Uh, we use the assumption of one delayed uh, precursor group to simplify the inner, our equation from the seven roots to how many roots? Two. And we notice that those two roots, one of them is very high and the other one is very small. small. And the very high roots will decay out very, very fast. Yes. And the, the, the small roots will decay with a longer period or in case of increase, the fast, the very, very large root will decay very abruptly and you will increase with the slower one. Yes, as long as your reactivity is less than beta, you are not critical, delayed prompted critical. Okay, so in, in those two situations, we note that there is a prompted jump or a prompted trap. If I ask you, define the prompted jump or define the prompted trap, and I show you the blots and show me what is the prompt jump or what is the prompt uh, drop, you should be able to calculate this. Then we came to a second approximation, which is if the second, the very fast uh, responsing uh, route is because of those delayed neutron, we will say that the, this will happen instantaneously. Instead of just moving very fast and you take time, we will say that this will have happen very instantaneously. And this help us to say that there's a very sharp one that takes milliseconds, and there is another one that takes minutes, for example, or seconds, and we reach to the prompt uh, jump approximation. And this prompt jump approximation allowed us to solve the, the problem the, the, uh, uh, in our equation, to solve it, and use from the prompt jump approximation the, um, the uh, formula for calculating n at, uh, let's say, n at t over n0, or n1 over n0, and we use this approximation to calculate what? To be able to calculate the, the kinetic parameters from the rod drop method or from the reactor period method. We use this prompt jump approximation. If you remember, you remember this formula? Give me a, a second to show you the formula that we use and I told you last time that this this formula will be used to calculate this 
facilities the Brahma Jump approximation. So the Brahma Jump approximation, we said that this jump will happen instantaneously. We will take care of this d by dt. We will make it equal to what? Zero. And we reach it to a situation where n1 over n0 equal to beta minus rho0 over beta minus rho1. We use this formula to calculate what? To calculate the experimental determination of the neutron kinetic parameter. We use it in the asymptotic period method. And we use it used in the rub rub method to calculate what? To calculate the kinetic parameters of the reactor. So N1 over N0 equal to this. And we stated that, okay, uh, N is what? The neutron population, which is being measured using a detector. So N will be proportional to R, and R is the detector response. So if you knew what's the detector response, for example, you will be able to calculate the reactor parameters. And we discussed two methods. One is called a rub the rub method and the other one is called source jerk when you move the your source instantaneously you said that the neutron the lead neutron will not the lead neutron precursor concentration will not respond instantaneously but it will take time so we said that the delayed neutron precursor concentration just before the source jerk and just after the source jerk will be exactly the same and we solve the equation so that we will get the kinetic parameter then finally the last chapter is the temperature feedback coefficients. I will not go through this one. Maybe next time if I have time, but I, I prefer to give you to conclude our next lecture by the types of nuclear reactors so that the course will be, the course will be uh, uh, done completely. So I hope that I did not put the, the uh, exam yet. I hope that uh, this will be uh, uh, a very good review for you guys before the exam. Have a good day.